Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Small Talk. Today's going to be one of those, um, I think, educational interviews, but an interesting one at the same time, because uh, my guest, she does um, gives workshops, very important ones, especially for these days. I'm really happy to welcome to the show, Joni Wright. Welcome, Joni. Thank you very much, Nancy. So we, I, before we start on those workshops, I just want to go back a little bit, okay? Because mm. you're, you're, you're in Vancouver. You live in Vancouver, right? I just live outside of the greater Vancouver area in a beautiful, sunny Tawasson. All right. Very nice. But, uh, but you're not from here originally, correct? No, I'm not. I moved uh, to the West Coast about 23 years ago. I'm originally from Ontario. Right. And I know you lived in Burlington. Because I and I also lived in Burlington at one time. <laughs> well, that might be another side conversation. But yeah, I did live in Burlington actually twice. Uh, oh. Once when I was smaller and then we moved back there, uh, you know, when I was a little bit older. So, um, yeah, a, a, a very interesting city that I think has probably grown since you and I were there. <laughs> I'm sure it has. Yeah. Now, one of the things you did uh, again, you got into the restaurant business. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, I started a little uh, catering business at, at my home. Um, you know, I love to cook, really passionate. All my friends said, you should go into business. And so I certainly did that. And I had an awesome five years of a lot of, um, you know, corporate catering, a lot of lunches, uh, cocktail, little receptions, those kinds of parties. Um, and then I also had the fortunate opportunity of operating a cafe in, um, in Toronto, oh. uh, good old Richmond and Spadina, the Loftus Lloyd Cafe and a hundred year old building. Nice. Um, and uh, that was really awesome. Uh, we ended up on uh, in the Toronto Life magazine as one of the places that ladies love to lunch. Uh, so that was a huge uh, honor and a great career um, uh, milestone. Um, now, uh, we closed that cafe um, because as many cafe owners uh, would attest to, it's so hard to really make a lot of money um, and uh, employ staff uh, with just a small cafe. So sadly, that cafe did close, but that was uh, really the uh, catapult to get me to move out west. So who knows? <laughs> That's it. It just yeah, a door closes, another one opens, right? Absolutely. Now, at some point, um, let's see now, um, you decided that you really liked the outdoors and everything that involves and the outdoors and you went, before we get to that, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Yes. You decided to go back to school? I did. I did. And I'm a lifelong learner and a crazy Sagittarian, also known to be loving to learn. But I always think um, if I want to do something, the first place I go is to find a course. Uh, so over my time, I've studied holistic healthcare practitioner, yeah. uh, holistic nutrition. Um, uh, I did earn my degree um, through uh, online learning uh, in 2006, seven, actually it ended up being seven years, but that would have been early online learning, um, right. the University yeah. of Phoenix. Right. Um, now, of course, you can get a degree uh, online with pretty much any university in the world. But For yeah. sure, yeah. Now, you also, you've completed your or, uh, organic master gardener course and ecological, ecological plant knowledge. Yes. So last fall, uh, again, went back to school, really interested in, uh, in gardening um, and really getting um, back to the earth. Um, uh, I've uh, had pleasure of being, uh, you know, uh, having a community garden plot, so I've been able to grow vegetables. Um, I've also been able to garden in ornamental gardening. So I uh, really thought that would be a great direction um, for a career change, really. And so um, I um, am still attending school, actually, at Gaia College. It's uh, located in Vancouver Island. Uh, so the Organic Master Gardener Program, Ecological Plant, plant Knowledge with Native Plants. Um, I'm moving into Landscape Design. And then the next course is Landscape Design with Native Plants. Nice. And so that's a lot about what I talk about in my workshops, Nancy, oh. that you alluded to earlier. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, how did that evolve into given workshops? Well, um, uh, it's really um, just a great opportunity for me. Um, 
I came to know Metro Vancouver Housing because I was a tenant in a Metro Vancouver Housing building uh, for a number of years. Um, and uh, I took over um, tending the building entrance gardens and uh, also became the community garden plot coordinator. So working with 35 different uh, community gardeners, a pretty large garden. And so um, just sharing my knowledge, uh, the folks at uh, Metro Vancouver Housing um, asked me if I'd be interested in doing some workshops. So I started last season and right. focused mostly just on gardening. Okay. And then this season, I thought, I think because of the heat dome mm -hmm. um, and the drought and the floods and the uh, unprecedented year in climate that BC in particular, but let's face it, the whole world is going through this as yeah. well, yeah. Um, uh, that we experienced. And um, it's like, wow, I think I need to open up this conversation. So it's definitely a workshop, but um, you know, I, I really want to engage with the attendees. Um, and let's talk about this. Absolutely, because um, it's important right now, right? Very important. And on Earth Day, uh, it's a really good conversation to be having. Um, and just over this past week, you know, I listened to uh, CBC Radio and they've had some really good interviews uh, just about, um, you know, all things related to um, Earth Day, whether it's about uh, making batteries for electric vehicles, whether it's about uh, sustainable investing, you know, and what does that word sustainable actually mean? And so I think it sort of it's all of us have a responsibility in in a way to learn more to educate ourselves about what we can do small steps have a big impact and so never to uh, negate that we do we do have a say we do have a voice right um, um, and another important issue that I'm really hot on right now Nancy is about invasive species um, you know invasive uh, you know there are uh, yeah. just um, invasive species we think of you know, we don't even know how many invasive species there are out there, but we think, uh, you know, out here in particular about blackberries, um, because they're prolific and they're growing everywhere. Um, but uh, the, the top of mind uh, invasive species that I think everybody could wrap their head around really is English ivy. And as I walk through the streets here in Tawasson, I see English ivy everywhere and it's strangling trees and it's taking over forest floors and um, uh, it's sold in nursery. So um, part of the issue about invasive species is that we ourselves actually inadvertently, you know, create a problem, um, but also that nurseries sell invasive species without any kind of warning. Right. So I'd like to, you know, put out there that, um, you know, nurseries should be adding a disclaimer, a little ticket, a little sticker, something that says, just be careful about how you use this plant. Because yeah, I know. I'm just going to mention that for the ivy, especially like I, I when I lived in my, my, my home, it actually gets under this the uh, siding, it does, right? And it'll just it'll go wherever it can. Toe and it will uh, crack your foundation. Um, uh, I was working on a project where I had uh, grown up the side of a home, and it was at that time it was dead, uh, but. Um, it had actually affixed itself to the stone on the house and it has taken the paint off. Wow. So, uh, and in some cases, you know, it's a woody plant. Yes. So you're dealing with the heavy, heavy branches. And so, um, you know, uh, that is an issue that people aren't aware of. Yeah. Um, and there's other more noxious you know, Japanese knotweed is, you know, one of the top, you know, invasive species in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got our issue here, of course, with Himalayan blackberries. Um, you know, these invasive species came over early with the settlers, but their intention was never to bring over an invasive species. No, of course not. Um, it was really uh, other reasons, right? Uh, food source, um, you know, blackberries, uh, while they're paying, um, uh, they're a food source for mammals and birds um, and other, um, you know, other living beings. And uh, it's um, also blackberries used. If you've ever taken a drive along Zero Avenue, uh, blackberries are planted between the Canada and U.S. border as well. So nobody's going to be getting through those blackberries. So <laughs> they have other purposes, but they are highly invasive and a big problem. Right, problem yeah. I guess in in that yeah, I was just thinking about that in the storybooks. That was probably what they considered the brambles, right? 
<laughs> totally the brambles. Yes. And you know, what are lost then, I think, Nancy, are things like hedgerows. So, you know, planting blueberries and you mm. know, raspberries and plants that are, um, you know, elderberries, uh, salmon berries, Saskatoon berries. So native plants that, um, you know, can provide that same purpose and source of food and right. uh, to, uh, you know, the other living beings out there um, uh, and try to remove the, the, the blackberry bushes. If you can imagine the number of seeds that could be in a thicket of blackberries, right. um, hundreds and thousands. And I think that's, you know, part of that problem, you know, uh, who's, who's sort of spreading the, the seeds, it's birds. Yes. And bats, yeah. uh, you know, they're they're eating the fruit, uh, other mammals, and they're pooping them out somewhere yeah. else. And so, you know, it just carries on. And, you know, then also there's hundreds of thousands of seeds. So the wind is blowing and, uh, you know, that would also contribute. Um, so uh, it's 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 a pretty large problem. Um, years ago, I was one of the fr uh, friend volunteer of the Semiamu Heritage Trail in South Surrey. And so a piece of this really lovely hiking trail, uh, cycling trail is a heritage. Uh, and so twice a year uh, working with the city, you would go in and one, uh, you know, in the spring or the fall, whichever one you're taking out invasive species and the other ones you're planting in native plants. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a constant, uh, you know, a great volunteer engagement opportunity as well. But, um, you know, we really do start to learn a little bit more about native plants. Mm. and how important they are to support the native biodiversity. I'm pretty sure that not very many of your uh, listeners and your viewers here would know that there are over three or 450 native bees to BC. Oh. So probably any, any average person could name one or two or maybe three, um, but certainly not over 450. And 350 of those native bees are found in the Okanagan. Oh, um, okay. Speak well to our agricultural area and, um, you know, where you'd find orchards and, and et cetera. But, um, you know, supporting uh, native biodiversity, the number of insects right. um, um, that, you know, need to, you think about the monarch butterfly. Yes. The monarch butterfly, one thing. <laughs> one thing and so if that one thing isn't available then we're in we're tipping our global ecological scale really and it's um, very impactful I remember seeing a documentary after the uh, uh the wildfires in Australia and the rehabilitation of koala bears and koala bears eat definitely eat uh, eucalyptus leaves right but one bear eats one variety of eucalyptus right so they showed the keepers um running to find seedlings of the eucalyptus and tying it in is this the right one and if the bear didn't need it she had to go to another and find it you know who i would never have thought that oh. that was the situation right so yeah. um if we think about um, um the birds um, insects and mammals that that live native um, they rely on native plants and we um, you know you see a new uh, developments you know a lot of boxwood a lot of greenery um, uh, I would say though I'm very impressed with developers now I would say a lot of them are planting Oregon grape which is uh, nice. really beautiful and in bloom right now so it's yeah. lovely yellow flowers um, really, um, you know, they're environmentally tolerant, they grow in this area, they require no uh, pesticides, no nothing, they're providing a food source, um, and, uh, and other things. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for developers to incorporate, um, and their landscaping, uh, a little bit more uh, native growth. That's perfect. I like that. You know, I often wonder, like, we have a lawn and I'm thinking, why do we have to have a lawn? Why do people right. feel the need to have lawns? You know, yes. it's it's just, it it's, makes no sense to me personally. I agree. If it was up to me, there wouldn't be a lawn in this uh, this condo, right. but I, not, right. I don't have that control, right? Right, right. I know. And I think that 
you know, that comes to, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, a cultural, um, societal, but, um, you know, that immaculate uh, lawn, it's very prestigious. There is, you know, a stigma that's attached to that, but um, there are organizations. Um, I know there's the Front Yard Flower Company and they, um, um, they plant their uh, flowers in people's front lawns. Um, <laughs> I love it. There was the Front Lawn Garden yes. Society at one time, yeah. and they too were, um, you know, working with homeowners to use their uh, yard as a food source as a, so that they would uh, reap the benefits of having that garden grown in their front. And they were also providing food source to the community, um, which is really the, the very heartwarming and um, I think the intention really of, of you know community garden plots and community growing that you really were sharing with those who uh, didn't have that same opportunity as you did so you're right you know, yeah. I, I love what you're saying because when I was at my, my when I had my home mm -hmm. I had uh, hollyhocks growing everywhere and, and yeah. yeah but I also had apple trees and I had you know other things but people would stop and take mm -hmm. pictures or, or talk to me right. and say, what a wonderful garden. And because I compost, I would have, I ended up would have garlic growing just weird spots or strawberries. Yeah. It was all so much fun. To me, it was fun. Yes. Love well, that. Nancy, that's a really good point about composting. And there's lots of great conversations to have about composting just in general. Yes. But um, that's also a way that invasive species are spread. Oh, so another another humdinger is bindweed, also known as morning glory. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Right. Yes. And this yes. much morning glory can create a big problem. So I know, you know, um, when disposing of invasive species, sometimes a compost isn't the right place. And if um, you know, in a hot compost, when the temperature would get to about 160 degrees, mm -hmm. not even that temperature would eradicate the bad thing, the invasive species. So what happened was they spread the compost over the gardens. I never and thought of that. It's not so, you know, major station. So it's the same thing you're talking about, only a little bit different, right? Yes, you're absolutely. Saying? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. something you, I've never heard people mention. Yeah, you know, might be spreading, uh, uh, you know, in space of species. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's well, very important to know. Well, it isn't, it is, and, you know, furthermore, there are invasive species that need to be disposed of um, at a transfer station. Okay. So you wouldn't even put them in your garbage yeah. because eventually they would end up somewhere that would end up somewhere that would end up in being a problem. Right. So um, I think, uh, in some municipalities, they are responsible for helping you remove it. A Japanese knotweed is a fairly good example. They're probably going to be putting some kind of um, a toxic uh, um, substance. Mm -hmm. Knotweed, like uh, uh, English ivy, can um, get into your foundation of your home yeah. and cause issues. So, um, but that's something that they would probably remove themselves. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, we talk of going to come back to the wonderful topic of native plants and really, um, you know, uh, learning a little bit more uh, about what is native. Um, uh, you can grow a lot of those plants. West Coast Seeds is a really good source um, for uh, seeds uh, mm -hmm. for growing. Right. Um, um, and the Invasive Species Council of BC has got a lot of amazing resources. They have a lot of workshops uh, themselves so you can become very educated because invasive species aren't just plants. Yeah, right. Um, you know, the gray squirrel was introduced in the early 1900s. And um, I think what I understand is by the time they got back uh, it's the Eastern gray squirrel and by the time it reached uh, out here, it was in the sort of the mid nineties. Um, and pushed out the Douglas squirrel, which is native, where you would probably find more in a rural area. Mm -hmm. But if you look around, you know, any city, you're going to see gray squirrels. That's an eastern gray squirrel. Yes. Right. Um, right. So well introduced, um, you know, they and, and invasive species push out native species. Um, right. Another good example is a goldfish. You know, people that, um, you know, dispose of their unwanted pets. A goldfish will eat their own. 
they will eat everything that they can get a hold of. And then uh, there's nothing left in the water. And then they eat the native grasses that are growing, you know, the native yes. uh, um, greenery that's growing. And then there's an empty lake with a bunch of big fat goldfish. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, let's, let's switch the topic to uh, um, pollinators, which are another really something super, super important. I know, very important. Um, and pollinators aren't just bees. Um, you know, butterflies and hummingbirds, other insects are pollinators too. We just don't think about them. We uh, sort of automatically think about bees because they're very busy and they play such a large role. Um, uh, but other, uh, other pollinators are out there. So um, with a little bit of research, you can actually plant plants that uh, draw uh, different pollinators. Right. So um, uh, hummingbirds, another pollinator tend to uh, gravitate to red, uh, bright colored uh, flowers, often flowers that are have sort of a longer petal so they can get their beak in. Um, and, and hummingbirds are a really interesting example because um, uh, even though they would be finding a food source uh, in flowers, it's always really great to have feeders up because uh, like all of us, they get dehydrated. Right. So uh, pulling that sugar water and that bed of nectar, uh, and, and even if it's put under a shaded area uh, as well. So they could even perch and uh, get out of the sun. I think that heat dome uh, that we experienced last year, that's, yeah. we haven't seen the last of that kind of weather. So I think it, it's our responsibility again to um, you know, to think about that. And, you know, when you're planting for pollinators, you're looking to plant from March to October. Mm -hmm. So um, you would like to have a garden that has got something blooming uh, for those seasons. Yeah. Um, hellebore uh, is an early, uh, like a late sort of winter, early spring uh, pollinator plant. Um, heather, also uh, right up there at the beginning of the season. So uh, when planning, designing your garden, you're gonna wanna think about how you can provide that food source, what different kind of plants that are native, preferably, that would be able to um, offer up uh, a food source for um, different pollinators as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. um, butterflies like to land. So um, plants that are umbellifers, so think of umbrella, so yarrow, um, those kinds of plants. Yeah. Uh, yarrow is also a native plant. Um, uh, plants that go to seed, so cilantro, parsley, uh, carrot, uh, like Saint Anne's, uh, Queen Anne's lace, that sort of a plant where butterflies can land and then mm -hmm. they have a bit of a, a landing for them. So um, yeah. I had the I love for bees because again, they, they loved my hollyhocks. The, the, yes. They were these very tiny little bees but there would be so many of them. And I couldn't, you know, I would wait every year for my, my, for my hollyhocks to bloom so that the, uh, the bees would be around. It was just so nice. <laughs> oh, it's just so awesome. You know, that first sound of that little buzz, it's like when a hummingbird flies by. Yes. Oh, kind yes. of sound, right? Yes, absolutely. And they're curious. They're really curious. Yes, yes, they are. They're feisty too, aren't they? <laughs> For sure. Uh, now we're, you know, we're running out of time, but so I just want to talk about what, um, what we haven't mentioned, a um, biodiversity um, or preparing for the cold. Oh, here it is. Community gardeners to prepare, preparing for the cold season. That's yes. a workshop you give, right? That's a workshop. Yes, um, that's going to be our September workshop. Um, and that is about, um, you know, winding your garden down preparing it for the winter season, um, you know, talking about uh, overwintering plants, how to plant garlic, uh, what can you plant that overwinters that would be there in the spring, you know, we look at yes. kale, one of our, our favorites, but right. uh, so people can overwinter. Um, also, that conversation also includes, um, you know, how do we protect our soil? Hmm. Um, you know, if, uh, with mulch, um, some kind of a cover could be leaves um, as well. You know, when I talk about the gardener to the community gardeners, I say plant wildflowers uh, in your garden yeah. in between the rows. Um, you know, it, it, it helps to to attract beneficial predatory insects that save right. the insects from you know taking down your other plants. 
Um, there's some companion planting in there. Uh, that's also really great. Um, and it does help uh, to uh, cover the soil as well. So uh, we would be talking about that kind of a thing and getting ready for the cold season because we don't have to say goodbye to gardening just because it's winter. That's true. <laughs> now, do you have, how can people get a hold of you? Well, they could email me at flowerpowerconsulting at gmail.com. Okay. Um, I would Make be sure happy that's included. That, answer that, any questions. I, oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Sure. Well, we're out of time, but th this okay. is. You know, again, I wanted to do this because I know how important it is, you know, to mm -hmm. learn about, as you said, learning about the invasive species, and what's native, and what's not native to the, to whatever area you're living in, um, and about the, and the insects and how important all these little bugs are <laughs> to the, they are. yeah, for sure. I know that, you know, uh, ants eat aphids and, and on and on. And uh, so it's all beneficial to us. It, right. It so is. And if I could make a little plug for the biggest little farm, it's a great yeah. documentary on Netflix. Um, and it really uh, it's about a couple that take over basically a, a dead farm and orchard and they bring it back to life. And you watch their journey, but you learn definitely learn a lot about composting and um, creating the right environment for great biodiversity. So what was the name again? It's called The Biggest Little Farm. The Biggest Little Farm on Netflix, right? On Netflix. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing this. Now, just stay on camera for a second. I just yep. want uh, to talk to the audience for a second. I hope you really, I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And listen, you know, if you have a lawn, you think about this. You have to fertilize it. You have to do all of these things, that, you know, want, it's just for looks when it when instead you could have something beneficial to to you or to the environment just think about it you don't have to do it but it's just something to to think about anyway thank you for watching the show i hope you uh subscribe and like and share and all those things and peace out everyone a sense of community to the wax a place to be a sense of community where you're free Rolling through the mountains, rolling through the valley, rolling through paradise with me. It's multicultural, you're sure to see it all. Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see. Come party in the park, go dancing after dark. Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see.